All right, another thing you see in coastal areas um, and just general areas where you have mountains is what's known as the rain shadow effect. And so you'll have um, air coming off of large land masses, I'm sorry, off of large bodies of water, and there'll be relatively damp, humid air. And when it hits a mountain range, it's forced up. And as it's forced up, it begins to cool. The molecules get spaced out more as they become less dense, as the air becomes less dense, and there's less heat in the air, less heat per unit area. This is known as adiabatic cooling. You can get uh, condensation and precipitation. And as the, mountain, as the air goes over the mountain, it sinks on the other side. It now warms up as it goes to lower elevations. It has dropped a lot of its moisture on this side. And so on the other side, what's known as the leeward side of the mountain, it's relatively dry. Again, this is known as the rain shadow effect. You have the windward side of the mountains that get lots of precipitation, and the leeward sides that gets, get a lot less. All right, so um, here's how we can think of these biomes as well. Again, we talked about tropical, temperate, and arctic. And so, of course, temperature is an overriding factor. Tropical areas are warm year-round. Of course, tropical forests can range from being quite wet to just being moderately wet. Where we live, the temperate broadleaf forest or temperate deciduous forest, again, a variation in temperature and variation in, in moisture as well. Of course, when you get to this end where you don't get a whole lot of precipitation, you're starting to get into drier areas, grasslands, and even really dry areas, deserts. Um, Arctic areas, of course, being defined by defined by being cold for most or all of the year, varying somewhat in precipitation, but not being nearly as, as not having nearly as much precipitation as some of these other biomes. So these are two main abiotic factors that are going to determine the type of biome you have, the temperature and the precipitation. So uh, the book points out an interesting phenomenon here. So you can look at, say, deserts. And you find deserts around the globe from the Sahara, African deserts, South American deserts, down here in the Atacama Desert, Southwest United States, parts of Australia. So they have the same general climate, but you have different species living in these areas, but they often exhibit what uh, we've talked about in the past, convergent evolution. So a good example of this are the euphorbs of Africa and the cacti of the Americas. You don't find cactuses in Africa, but you have these group of plants known as the euphorbs that exhibit the same kind of growth patterns as cactuses because they're living in the same kind of climate. And you went to Africa and saw this, you might think, oh, there's a cactus, but it's actually not. It just happens to look like a cactus because of where it grows. So indeed, tropical rainforests, warm, wet year-round, um, Amazon, the Congo. This image of Africa is a little broad. The, the tropical rainforest is actually a bit more constrained to the center portion here in the Congo. And the same, much of India is not really tropical. It's tropical, but it's not all rainforest by any means. But here in Indonesia, a lot of that north part of, of uh, Australia. Deserts, you find deserts primarily at 30 degrees and th north and south latitude where you have those high pressure systems that dry air. Not uniformly, of course, but in some areas, the southwest, North Africa, Middle East, the Atacama Desert of South America, the Namib Desert of South Africa, uh, parts of Australia. Savannah, grassland with sparse tree cover, um, good chunks of Africa, parts of South America. Um, Chaparral, this is also known as a Mediterranean climate. Um, you see this around the Mediterranean, Southern California, South Africa, South Coast of, of um, Australia a sort of shrubby climate, mostly warm throughout the year, although they'll have a cooler season, um, often with a seasonality in precipitation. South Af South, um, Southern California, for example, gets most of its precipitation in the win winter. There are, because of those dry seasons, there's many fire-adapted plants in these areas, and that's why Southern California tends to have a fair number of wildfires. Grasslands, 
So these are areas that get less rainfall than forested area, and so they really can't support trees. Um, so in the Great Plains of the United States, the east coast is wetter, but it gets drier as you go further west. Essentially, much of the grasslands in central United North America are in the rain shadow of the Rocky Mountains. Um, so this coniferous or boreal forest, again, much of Canada and Siberia dominated by evergreen trees with long winters, shorter growing seasons. The temperate forest, temperate deciduous forest, um, where we live, much of the United St Eastern United States, much of Northern Europe, a good chunk of China, these leaf trees that lose their leaves in the fall um, in response to that colder season. Tundra, again, this is area where you're far enough north that you get into permafrost and you don't get any trees growing. Um, you also see the equivalent of tundra at lower latitudes when you get on the tops of mountains and you get above what it's called tree line, <clears throat> and you essentially have the equivalent of a tundra habitat, long cold winters. All right, let's talk about aquatic biomes for a moment. Of course, we can talk about lakes and the ocean. And um, so bodies of water are characterized by having an upper layer where there's uh, sunlight, enough sunlight for water for photosynthesis to occur but then having deeper portions that are relatively dark. And of course, in the ocean, it gets deep enough that it's, there's no light at all. Lakes, for the most part, will still have some light at the bottom, but there's a lot less than at the surface. Um, the benthos, that's the bottom. In lakes, you have what's called the littoral, littoral zone, and that's the zone around the edge of the lake where it's relatively shallow, and you get vegetation growing out of the water, the equivalent is the, in the ocean is what's called the continental shelf where it's relatively shallow. Um, the pelagic is just the open ocean um, as opposed to the continental shelf. Um, now you have um, of course tropical oceans where you find a lot of the world's coral reefs or basically along the equator um, the southern tip of Florida, uh, Hawaii, throughout the Caribbean, much of Indonesia, where you find them. Um, of course, you get most of the open, uh, most of the ocean being this pelagic zone, this open ocean with these very deep waters, these deep benthic zones. Um, the uh, intertidal zones are right along the coasts um, that are impacted by tidal action. Um, estuaries. So see a picture. These are areas where you have rivers meeting the ocean. Um, and they have a unique ecology there. Um, lakes are um, characterized by having a thermally stratified water structure in the summer. They're warmer at the surface and colder down deep. All that sunlight in that photic zone warms the water and the water is less dense and so it kind of just sits on top. The thermocline is the transition between the warmer and the cold water. What happens is you get turnover of that water so in the fall as it gets colder the surface waters begin to cool and they can reach a temperature at which they're basically at equilibrium throughout the lake and then you get um, wind action can help to mix this water up because now it's of equal density and it can mix quite readily. This, of course, uh, this spreads um, nutrients from the bottom to the top. It also takes oxygen from the top to the bottom. So it kind of equilibrates temperature and nutrient levels and oxygen levels in the lake. In the summer, the bottom tends to become more and more anoxic or low in oxygen as the summer proceeds, so the fall mixes that all up. If you're far enough north, of course, the surface of the, um, oh, here we go, the surface of the lake can freeze in the wintertime, and um, so then it just kind of sits there, but then in the spring when that ice melts, you can then get another turnover, and then finally stratification in the following summer. <coughs> 
Lakes can also be characterized by their nutrient loads. Oligotrophic lakes are relatively low in nutrients and have nice clear water. They tend to have rocky bottoms and in general are uh, somewhat younger lakes. Eutrophic lakes are ones that have higher nutrient loads, lots of vegetation, lots of photosynthetic activity. They tend to have a muddy or sediment filled bottom um, and be often older lakes. Wetlands are another type of aquatic system. They are land that really is not a lake, but they are wet for part or all the year, often with lots of vegetation in them. <coughs> and they come in various types from basically uh, wet grassland type areas to swamps which are dominated by trees to marshes which are on the coast. Um, and then of course rivers have their own unique ecology. An estuary is where a river runs into the ocean and it sort of spreads out into different channels. It tends to be relatively flat and um, you also have what you call marshes here. Marshes are coastal areas that are dominated by herbaceous vegetation, um, non-woody vegetation basically, and they're influenced a lot by tidal action with fresh water coming down the river at low tide and then salt water coming into the marsh or estuary during high tide. And so you have some areas where tides can be relatively extreme and you'll have this intertidal zone, this section of the coast that is inundated at high tide but then exposed at low tide and you get a lot of interesting uh, organisms that live here that can tolerate those particular conditions. Um, the intertidal zone is not terribly fascinating in a place like the Gulf Coast of the United States because the beach is relatively long and flat and so it's just a sandy beach. But if you go to a place like Washington, Northern California, Washington, Oregon, where the coast drops off more into the ocean in many places, you get a very stark divide between the high and low tide. Open ocean, lots of large critters out there, the whales and sharks and these animals that swim great distances, um, dolphins, that, uh, etc. Coral reefs, quite diverse, again tropical, um, dominated by the namesake animal, the corals, this type of cnidarian that has a shell and lives in these co colonies. So here's a cluster of a bunch of these cnidarians forming a cluster of corals, if you will. Um, their shells build up over time to build up the reef. Deep sea thermal vents, these are interesting, unique habitats down deep in the ocean. It looks like it's light here, but it would really be perpetual darkness except for the submarine is there that's shining light on it. And so you get these funky two worms and these white crabs. They're lacking pigmentation because there's no light down there, so these are red because of some hemoglobin in their, in their in blood, I believe, of these tube worms. <coughs> um, these deep sea thermal vents where you have the break in the crust and you've got this warm water seeping out of the seabed, bringing lots of nutrients with it. All right, species distributions. Um, of course, not all species are equally distributed. In fact, most species are not equally distributed. They tend to be found in particular spots. You can see there are clearly some places in Australia that are quite advantageous for um, kangaroos and other areas where they're not nearly as common. So clearly there must be ideal conditions, temperature, precipitation, vegetation, whatever, that's allowing kangaroos to thrive in those particular spots. Um, these distributions can change over time. And this is a case, this is the cattle egret, and it's native to Africa, but it was introduced to South America in the late 1800s. And it has slowly migrated up through Central and North America. And so it's expanding its range as this, this non-native species. All right, what factors can limit a species distribution? Well, I've already used, used these terms. You can talk about biotic factors, living factors, and non-living factors. Some of those biotic living factors, of course, competition between species, predators and their effect on prey and vice versa, pathogens, herbivory. These are all species interactions that can impact the distributions of the species they're interacting with. <coughs> 